Good morning and um, welcome to the Cato Institute. My name is Marianne Tupi. I'm a senior policy analyst here at Cato and also editor of Human Progress, which is an educational website um, that uh, tries to put together as many statistics about human well-being uh, as possible in order to present to our users and uh, to the general public uh, the, a, a more real um, picture of the world than, uh, than the headlines would suggest. Speaking about the headlines, it is perhaps an understatement to say that we live in an era of great pessimism. Uh, this pessimism is not distributed evenly across the world, but it is felt very acutely in many Western democracies, including ours here in the United States. Some three quarters of Americans believe that the United States is going in the wrong direction. And the choices that the electorate will be presented with come November exaggerate rather than soothe the national feeling of impending doom. Americans feel poorer even though our GDP per capita has never been higher. We feel less safe even though international conflicts have almost disappeared and deaths from terrorism are extremely rare. Overall life expectancy is at an all-time high and progress is being made in curing cancer, Alzheimer's and HIV AIDS. Globally, the speed of improvements in human well-being is staggering. Fueled by its embrace of capitalism and globalization, Chinese per capita income has grown by an incredible 900% in my lifetime. During that time, Indian life expectancy rose by a third from 52 years to 68 years. And that's three billion people right there. Yet for all the good news, gloom is pervasive and pessimism about the future is widespread. The gap between the perception and the reality of daily, daily life is not new. In 1830, British historian Thomas Babington Macaulay observed, quote, we cannot absolutely prove that those are in error who tell us that society has reached a turning point, that we have seen our best days. But so said all before us, and with just as much apparent reason. On what principle is it that we see nothing but improvement behind us, yet we expect nothing but the deterioration ahead of us?" Unquote. Luckily, a small but merry group of optimists has been trying to cheer us up. Uh, they include the late, uh, the late uh, Julian Simon, Indur Goklani of the Cato Institute, uh, Charles Kenny, Bjorn Lomborg, Deirdre McCloskey, Steven Pinker, Matt Ridley, Max, Ro Max Roser, Hans Rosling, as well as our two speakers today. Johann Norberg is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute and a writer who focuses on globalization, entrepreneurship, and individual liberty. Norberg is the author and editor of several books, books exploring libertarian ideas, including Financial Fiasco, how America's infatuation with home ownership and easy money created the economic crisis. His book, In Defense of Global Capitalism, which was originally published in 2001, uh, was since then published in 20 different countries. Prior to joining Cato, Norberg was uh, head of political ideas at Timbro, a Swedish free market think tank uh, between 2003 and 2005. He then served as a senior fellow at the Brussels-based Center for New Europe, and uh, that was in 2006. Norberg received his master's degree from Stockholm University in the history of ideas, and today he's here to present his new book and to talk about it. Uh, the new book is called Progress, 10 Reasons to Look Forward to the Future. And with a hearty commendation of this book, please help me welcome Johan Norberg. Thank you very much, Marian, and thank you so much for keeping 
humanprogress.org, uh, my daily dose of sanity um, when I otherwise just read the news and get the impression that the world is falling apart. I've used that a lot when I wrote this book. I'm also honored to have Ron Bailey joining me here on the stage. Uh, one of my intellectual heroes who have written many books outlining the progress that mankind has done. He explained to me once, and I think he writes about this in his latest book, that um, when he wrote a book on human progress, his agent said that, look, this book will make us some money. Um, but if you had written a book outlining why the world will end very shortly, then we would both be rich men. So why do you write a book on progress? With all the trouble in the world, why do I write a book about reasons to look forward to the future? Well, for three reasons. Uh, one, because it happened. And it's one of the most important things that ever happened to mankind. Two, because no one believes me when I say, tell them that that's the case. And three, it's dangerous that they don't, because pessimism is a powerful political force. Let me start with what happened and how it happened. This is the um, GDP per capita around the world over the last 2,000 years, where we can see that not much happened until the early 19th century, when suddenly we saw an explosion of wealth, starting in the Western world, but then spreading around the world in the era of globalization. And in 1820, you notice that um, there wasn't much wealth around in the world. Even in the, ri the richest countries suffered from desperate poverty. If we had shared all the wealth that existed in the world in 1820, uh, the average person around the world would have a GDP per capita lower than the GDP per capita of Mozambique today. So everything happened afterwards, and that's everything that made our life here today possible. It made this possible, the eradication of poverty around the world over the last 200 years. 200 years ago, 90% of the world population lived in extreme poverty, around less than $2 per day of consumption, adjusted for inflation, purchasing powers. And uh, today, it's less than 10%. Since 1990, this has accelerated. In 1990, 37% of the world population lived in extreme poverty. Today, it's around 9%, which means that for the first time in world history, the absolute number of poor people has been reduced as well. And for the first time since the 1800s, we have seen fewer people living we have fewer people living in extreme poverty today than in 1800. That might not sound like much progress, but if you consider the growth in world population, it is tremendous progress. In 1800, there were only 60 million people around the world who did not live in extreme poverty. Today, 6.5 billion people do. And this is, as I pointed out, accelerated since 1990. Over that period, world population grew by around 2 billion people, and yet the absolute number of extremely poor was reduced by 1.25 billion people, which means that every minute that we talk about this subject, another 100 people rise out of extreme poverty. Mankind has never, ever seen that kind of progress. And here is another graph that summarizes the uh, changes that have taken place over the last few hundred years. Life expectancy, if that continues to climb, it means we've done something right when it comes to wealth, health, nutrition, and lifestyle. In 1900, the average life expectancy around the world was 31 years. Today, amazingly, it's 71 years. In the year 1800, no country, nowhere, had a life expectancy higher than 40 years. Today, there's not a single country anywhere with a life expectancy shorter than 40%. And this continues every day around the world, not for every group, there are always laggards, but the rise in life expectancy continues nonetheless. The 
country with best, best practice has increased life expectancy by three months every year for the last 140 years, and that continues. We can celebrate every birthday by just approaching death by nine months rather than one year. And this because of the reduction in child mortality uh, in many sub-Saharan African countries. This has resulted in the fastest progress in life expectancy we've ever seen. Some countries like Botswana and Rwanda increased life expectancy by 10 years over the last 10 years. Which means that collectively you can say that every person got 10 years older, but none of them approached death by a single day. And those new years are also good years, as a review of the literature pointed out in Lancet recently. Present evidence suggests that people are not only living longer than they did previously, but also they are living longer with less disability and fewer functional limitations. So all those data are quite impressive over the last 200 years, but it's even more impressive in the last few years, in the last 25 years. This is a summary graph over hunger, poverty, illiteracy, child mortality, and the six leading pollutants in Britain. I use Britain because the book was originally published there, but if we had had uh, the United States there, it would have been even more impressive. And you can see that all those things indexed uh, so that 100% is the level in, in 1990 have been more halved or more than halved over these uh, few years. When it comes to wealth, we've created as much increase in GDP per capita in the last 30 years as we did in the 30,000 years before. And yet, this does not come across as good news to everybody. In the Western world, in Western Europe, and in the United States, a lot of people look at these data and think that they are the losers, that they've lost out. At least relatively, they are the losers of globalization because progress has not been as fast here as it's been in many other countries around the world. Something strange happened um, in the years since I wrote uh, the Cato book In Defense of Global Capitalism in 2003 and this recent book. Because at that time I, I kind of wrote the same book about human progress, I've got to confess that, and how free markets and free trade could benefit us all. At that time the opponents were the leftists in the anti-globalization movement who thought that free trade, multinational companies, investments, free market capitalism, that might benefit us, the rich in the richest countries. But there would be losers, poor people in poor countries who would be exploited, who would see their life uh, living standards deteriorate. I think it's fair to say that these 13 years that have passed have proved them wrong. The, uh, development in countries like Vietnam, India, China, and many, many other countries that have integrated into the global economy has proved that it was a tremendous boom to their living standards, to their wealth. And a lot of people accept that. But then they say, oh, we were wrong in thinking that they would lose out from capital, international capitalism. They won big time, which must mean that we are the losers in rich countries because they still believe in the zero-sum game. The idea that the economy and the world economy is a zero-sum game in which people can only gain if someone else loses out. A kind of pre-Adam Smithian view of the economy where trade does not benefit both parties to the agreement. And that's a very dangerous assumption uh, that leads to a search for scapegoats. This is a graph that you might have seen. This is the so-called elephant graph of uh, the increase in average per capita in household income of each percentile group around the world, all over the world, between 1988 and 2008. It's a former World Bank economist, Branko Milanovic, who, who assembled the data and created this graph, and it looks a bit like an elephant, because you can see that the poor in the 
world, most of the poor have increased their incomes dramatically over those 20 years by some 40 to 80 percent. And you also see that the elephant's trunk is raised because the super rich in the world, the 1 percent or the 2 percent, they've also benefited tremendously. But look at what became known as the Western middle class and the lower middle classes in Europe and the United States, around the 80th and 90th percentile. People who didn't see any kind of income growth over those 20 years. This was the graph that was presented around the world as the graph that explains globalization and the losers of globalizations. Those who turn to leftists and rightists populists, those who vote for Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders. And it is a powerful graph, um, but it's wrong. Uh, as been presented recently in a, um, a very heroic uh, work by the Resolution Foundation. Uh, this is a combination of um, various data sources. Uh, people move through these percentiles, countries shift, Population growth in some places, but not in others, mean that the 18th to 90th percentile is not the same people. It's not the Western middle classes. Yes, that's true. That it used to be the case in 1988 that that, uh, that was the Western middle class, but not anymore. First, for three reasons. First of all, the countries in these, um, this data shifted dramatically. Um, there wasn't data for a lot of these countries in 1988, but there were in 2008. Big poor countries like Vietnam, Congo, uh, Russia were added since then. So, and that lowers the income growth in every percentile, basically, because you add poor countries. So you can see that the old elephant graph is the blue one, the yellow dotted line is the one if we keep the countries in the sample um, constant over these years. Then you can see that the Western middle class, so to speak, increased their income growth from 0% to 10%. But there's another graph there as well, the red line. And the red line um, compensates for something else, that population growth was bigger in poor countries than in rich countries, which means that a lot of people, that they took a larger part of every percentile. And it means that they, especially the income uh, population growth in Asia, pushed the Western middle class from the lower percentiles into the higher ones. So what used to be the 80th and 90th percentile of Western middle class people were replaced by the richest people in China. And they are still poorer, some 60% as rich as the Western middle classes, which means that it looks like, poverty, that, like income growth is, is coming down in those areas as well. But that's more an illusion that comes from population growth. So if you keep population growth, if you pretend that the population is stable over these years, the elephant graph shifts to the red line instead. And then it's not the 0% income growth, it's not a 10% income growth, it's a 25% income growth for the 18th to 19th, uh, 90th percentile. But then something else interesting happens when you look at the raw data. There are a few countries that really stagnated or even uh, saw a reduction in incomes over those 20 years. Japan and ex-communist countries like Bulgaria. And They've all, they made more progress after 2008, but that's not relevant for this graph because it only goes to 2008. So that's true, that did happen, but that is not where the Western middle classes live. They don't live in Eastern Europe, they do not live in Japan. So if you adjust for that as well and look at a new version of the elephant graph, you can see that a constant population with constant countries, and you accept Japan and ex-communist countries, we have the red line instead, where the percentile that we talk about as the Western middle class increased their incomes by some 40% over these 20 years. Um, we don't need to bother about the, the yellow one. So there has been an increase in incomes in Western countries, for Western middle classes as well, 
But I also have to point out that that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is not what you have in your wallet, but what you can buy for it, the kind of purchasing power, the kind of technology that's at your disposal. It's much more than income. And we've seen progress in many other areas. Cleaner air, since, since the 1970s when I was born, we've seen more than, a, you've more than half the leading pollutants uh, that affects your lungs, your forests, your rivers, your seas. Uh, You've halved crime rates, homicide rate in the US has been cut in half since 1980, including better technology from better drugs to the internet and another 10 years of life expectancy. If that's the losers of globalization, then we need to reconsider what we mean by a loser. What is progress? What does it mean? To me, it means that we can do more things today than we could before. We know more things, we're able to create more things. And as the great thinker Robert Heinlein put it, progress is not made by early rises. It's made by lazy men looking for easier ways to do things. <laughs> Basically, we do more things with the resources that are at our disposal. We can solve more problems, we can deal with more of our problems, we can satisfy more of our ambitions and more of our demands. And we do that by exploring and thereby finding new, better knowledge about how the world works. And not just exploring, but also experimenting with those ideas, producing new innovations in technology, artificial fertilizers, better crops, new machines that make us more productive, container shipping that makes it possible to exchange all those things. But it's not just that we explore and experiment, but it's also that we exchange the results of this with trade, communication, movement over borders, which means that we can use knowledge that we do not have ourselves. So exploration, experimentation, and exchange, which means that we need freedom, freedom to think, freedom to be innovative, freedom to implement your ideas and experiment, and freedom to trade across borders. We need liberty. And therefore, it's no coincidence that this began to happen in Northern Europe, in Western Europe, and in Northern America. And it began to happen in China, India, Vietnam, after they began to open up their economies. More people than ever can now contribute to this progress, because they have access to more knowledge than ever, and they are freer than ever to experiment with those ideas and exchange this with other people. As Julian Simon, the grand old man of development optimism put it, the human being, the human brain, is the ultimate resource. And that's also something that's reproducible. The human brain is actually pleasantly re reproducible. At least it's a beautiful thing when it happens between consenting adults. But the problem is that almost no one believes this. Let's go back to this graph about human progress since 1990 in all those areas, in all those dimensions. I posted this on Twitter a couple of, a few weeks ago to tell the world about, look, this is the world in one graph. While we're complaining, this is what happened to the world. And one of the first responses I got was this from a British woman who retweeted this and said, Oh my God, this is the startling graphics confirming my general hell in a handcart feeling. In other words, she read the graph upside down. <laughs> so, so, so she thought that poverty has, had doubled, that child mortality had doubled, that pollution, that um, illiteracy had doubled around the world. And I asked her, how did you get that impression? And she responded, Oh, I do pay close attention to the news, <laughs> to the media. I follow what happens in the world. I read about the floods, the war, the famines that go on in the world. And that's true. That is something that happens. But it also means that she misses out the great trends around the world. And so, as Mariam put it, um, it the, all the gallops show that people are almost by nature pessimists. 6% of Americans think that the world on the whole is becoming a better place. More people believe in ghosts and UFOs than believe in progress. Asked whether global poverty had halved, doubled, or remained the same in the past 20 years. 
only 5% of Americans said that it had halved. And actually, it had more than halved. Most thought that it was stable or had doubled. By guessing randomly, a chimpanzee would pick the right answer out of three choices far more often, which means that this is not ignorance. You cannot call it ignorance if you can't beat a random choice. We must have inaccurate assumptions about the world based on some misleading or outdated information about the world. And as this British woman, uh, most people get it from the media, from the headlines, from the breaking news. Uh, I picked this illustration. It's from a Sweden's biggest newspaper. I, I love that headline because it says, total chaos everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there was some bad weather and some traffic uh, stops and thousands of people were stuck at the airports uh, because of this. Total chaos everywhere. Because an airplane accident is news. 40 million flights taking off landing safely every year is not news. The fact that we have seen since the 1970 an increase in the number of passengers tenfold, and yet the number of accidents and fatalities has halved. That's not news. That's statistics. That's something that we don't care about. And in a way, that's a good thing. If there were news about plans la flights landing safely, it would mean that it was a strange occurrence. It would have been news. But the problem is that when we only hear about those accidents, those disasters, then we think that th this is the only thing that goes on in the world. It was made the news recently that tens of thousands of people in northern Nigeria are now threatened by chronic undernourishment and famine. And that's correct. That happens. We need to know about that. But I have never read a story about the fact that 8 million Nigerians were liberated from chronic undernourishment over the last 25 years. Because that's not the kind of shocking, instantaneous, horrific thing that makes the news. It's not really about the media. It's not the journalist's fault that bad news sells. Because when the media is not there, we actually invent um, stories, rumors that are even worse. So it seems like we are to blame, uh, the readers. And that's what all the journalists tell me as well when I ask them about this. It doesn't sell good news. We need something dramatic and shocking to, um, give, to, to, to sell um, the news. And I think this is because we're genetically predisposed to pay more attention to bad things. Bad is stronger than good because the bad things could be a threat to our survival. Our hunter-gatherers forefathers who were a bit more worried, who didn't relax, who looked anxiously towards the horizon, whether there might be predators or new storms, they probably survived more often than others. So they passed on their genes to us, but also their stress hormones and their attention to all the bad things that could go wrong in the world. Now add to this another factor, the fact that we are by nature nostalgic. We tend to think that the good old days were in another era, a previous era, uh, in our childhood or even before this, uh, even before that. These are some scenes from a brilliant French movie in 1959, Le Belle de Nuit, about a man who goes back in time to a better era, the good old days where everything was wonderful. But then he's there and he thinks it's pretty good, but then he meets an old man who tells him, oh, you should have been there when I was young. Life was much better. And then he travels back in time to that era. And it's, it's okay, a bit poorer and a bit dirtier. But an old man tells him, oh, no, you should have been with in that era when I grew up. That was the good old days. And he travels back in that time as well. And it goes to prove that nostalgia is always there. As the cultural historian Arthur Herman put it, virtually every culture, past or present, has believed that men and women are not up to the standards of their parents and forebears. And uh, you might, if you haven't seen this film, you might recognize the intrigue from Woody Allen's Midnight in Paris, where he used the same kind of story to, to show us that we always think, and everybody has always thought, that the good old days were days past. And interestingly, when I ask people about those good old days, when were they? If this is not the golden era, when was society as it, at its most harmonious and, 
and they most often happen to mention the era when they grew up. People of my generation say it's the 1980s. The baby boom generation often say it's the 1950s. Uh, and I, one hypothesis I've got is that this present outburst of nostalgia is a result of the baby boom generation retiring and thinking back to the good old days in the 1950s, where life wasn't that great after all, where um, um, old age meant that you were poor, where we had still Jim Crow laws and racial segregation in the United States, where we had the threat of immediate nuclear annihilation. But we know that we solved those problems. We know that we got through those bad old days. So now we can think back to them as the nice era when we grew up, when things were exciting because we were young and the future was full of promise. And at the same time, we felt fairly secure because our parents were burdened with all the difficult decisions. They paid the bill and they were worried about all the things that could happen to their kids. Now, as we grow up, as we become parents, we begin to think that uh, this is much more difficult nowadays. It used to be much simpler. And this is what Otter Herman uh, thought as well, that often we confuse a certain shift, a change in ourselves, taking on new responsibilities, perhaps some physical decay, and we confuse that with the world and think that this goes on everywhere. It's not us, it's the world. So if we have that genetic programming where we pay more attention to everything bad that happens or could happen in the future, and we're also nostalgic, so we think that the good old days are behind us, and you add another factor, a new factor, global media, global 24 hours a day media that looks at everything around the world then we have more bad things to take into consideration. Because even though homicide rates decline, there's always a serial murderer on the loose somewhere. Even though we have fewer international wars, there's always a war going on somewhere. And then those bad things will always top the new cycle. Even though the risk of being killed in a natural disaster has declined by almost 99% over the last 100 years, there are always people dying in a natural disaster. And then that will top the new cycle everywhere. And then we get the impression that this is the everyday occurrence for most people around the world. And add to that social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and all those places where anyone could, can add their particular perspective on the world. And what do you share with people yourself on those uh, platforms? Well, most, it happens that we share some good news, but most often it's something horrific, something dramatic, something shocking. Human suffering is not new, but cell phone cameras are new. And then it means that we can see anything that goes wrong anywhere in the world instantaneously. We can see it while it happens before we know whether people will survive or not. And that triggers our fear, it triggers our fight or flight hormones, and it makes us scared about the world. What do I share on social media? Well, often it's some weirdo that I've never heard of in a city whose name I cannot even pronounce, who did something stupid. Then I think I have to tell people about this stupid thing. And everybody does the same thing. So we wake up in the morning and hear about all those weirdos, all those bizarre people doing bad things everywhere. And we think that most people are like that. But they're not, and that's why we're sharing it because it is a strange, uh, strange occurrence, a bizarre occurrence. So unfortunately, few, I, th I think this is accelerating with the rise of social media uh, as well. At an accelerating pace, we pay attention to all those bad things and we get the impression that the world is falling apart, even though all the objective data proves otherwise. And that's dangerous. It's dangerous politically. As uh, Donald Trump put it when he first uh, made clear his uh, ambitions to uh, run for president of the United States, this country is a hellhole and we're going down fast. End of quote. Morning in America, it ain't <laughs> anymore. 
Um, and that changes perspectives uh, on the world. If you look at Trump's voters, compared to 50 years ago, life in the US is worse. Yes, 75% of his voters say. But so does Bernie Sanders' voters, because it's the same thing among, uh, among the leftist populists. They also think that this country is a hellhole, partly for different reasons. It's the inequality, it's uh, rising sea levels, global warming, disasters, uh, and so on. And, and Hillary Clinton says the same thing, only in full sentences. Um, <laughs> she, she, she tells us that, yes, you are angry. You should be angry because everything is awful and only I can make things right. And this is the problem, fear is the health of the state. Political forces can always stifle progress. They can stop this creativity, they can block the technology, they can block trade if they like. You know the old joke, if the opposite of pro is con, then what is the opposite of progress? Ah, uh, ah, uh, yeah. It's not new, that has always happened. And in every election season, we see the same kind of thing. In every election, you threaten people that if the other guy wins, the water taps will run dry, the sun will not set tomorrow, uh, will not rise tomorrow. But this is new, the sense that everything is already awful in the US and in Europe and in other places. The world is dangerous. It is dangerous. And if it's dangerous, if the world is falling apart, you need a strong man or a strong woman or a muscular government that sets things right. If a Martian tried, from the planet Mars, tried to understand what goes on on planet Earth by listening to a speech by Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders or Jeremy Corbyn in Britain or Marine Le Pen in France, he would think that everything is on fire on planet Earth because they only talk like violence is spiraling out of control, inequality, poverty is rising everywhere. Everything is dangerous. And if everything is dangerous, we have to protect what little we have. And we need that strong person, that big government that helps us. If people left to their own devices create a lot of progress, well, in that case, we can have more freedom. We can have open societies and open economies because we'll see more progress in the future. But if we think that people left to their own devices and free to do things and trade and move. If we think that they create chaos, chaos everywhere, then we need those, those strong men who will take care of all of us. In social psychology, there's a discussion about this, about an authoritarian um, reflex. Uh, people like Jonathan Haidt, Karen Stenner, has pointed out that authoritarianism, which is kind of a loaded term, but we can say some kind of statism where you, and, and um, some sort of interest in blocking people's freedom, blocking globalization, uh, controlling people rather than setting them free. That kind of authoritarianism is not a stable personality trait. It's more like a predisposition that a lot of people have. And it can be triggered, and it triggers when people get the sense that their way of life is threatened, when they have the sense that their society, that, their, that people like them or their country is being threatened by external forces or by chaos. That authoritarian dynamic sets in. When people read fake stories about things going wrong in society, they become more authoritarian in other spheres in responding to other questions that are not related at all to the very thing that went wrong in that fake story. Which means that we all sort of end up in this protective mode when we think that things are going wrong. If you only see horror and horrible people, if you wake up and listen to the breaking news, watch your Twitter feed and find out that there are only weirdos out there and they're out to destroy your way of life, you become more authoritarian, you become more statist, and you begin to vote for the strong man or for the big government. So I wrote this book to sum up, not out of complacency, not as a way of telling people that Look, everything is in order. We don't have to bother about these things anymore. Let's go home and have a quiet night. I wrote this book because I'm worried about this progress, because we cannot take it for granted. 
It didn't happen automatically by itself. It happened because people were given more freedom to explore, to experiment, and to exchange the results of that. If we have political forces in power that blocks those freedoms, those individual liberties, those economic freedoms, then we'll see less freedom, less progress in the future. So we have something to fear, and that is fear itself, and the risk that fear will become a self-fulfilling prophecy, and it will be self-generating. Because if we think there are only problems out there, only stagnation, then we'll block the reforms, the new technologies, the free trade um, reforms that should take place to create more progress. And then we'll see more stagnation and we'll be even more fearful in the future. And it'll be even more difficult to push through the reforms that we need to make progress. It could happen. We can block progress like that. It has happened before. It can definitely happen again. It's bad for mankind. But more than that, it's a boring way to spend your life to stand in the way of other people's progress. So to conclude, in the words of another one of my intellectual heroes, that great thinker, Captain James T. Kirk of the Starship Enterprise in the United Federation of Planets, only a fool stands in the way of human progress. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johan. Also a wonderful book. <laughs> <laughs> that I was hoping to have on sale, and for reasons that I shall uh, have to apologize for the rest of my life, uh, it's not out there. So, uh, sorry, Amazon Ron. Does sell it, <laughs> and it makes wonderful, uh, wonderful presents, both of them, um, for the upcoming holidays. Um, Ron uh, Bailey is uh, an award-winning uh, science correspondent for Reason Magazine and Reason.com, uh, where he writes a weekly uh, science and technology column. He uh, was one of the original uh, optimists uh, out there um, and, has, uh, and, and has a tremendous pedigree in uh, terms of promoting uh, ideas that uh, Johan is talking about or was talking about today. Bailey is the author of The End of Doom, um, Environmental Renewal for the 21st Century, and also of Liberation Biology, a moral and scientific case for the biotech revolution. From 1987 to 1990, uh, Bailey was a, st a staff writer for Forbes magazine, uh, covering economic, scientific, and business topics. Uh, prior to joining Reason in 1997, uh, he produced several weekly national uh, public television uh, series, including uh, Think Tank and Technopolitics, as well as several other PBS and ABC documentaries. He is also an editor of a number of books, including Global Warming and Other Eco Myths, um, Earth Report 2000, Revisiting the True State of the Planet, and also EcoScan, The False Prophets of Ecological Apocalypse. Ron is uh, a member of uh, Society of Environmental Journalists and the American Society of Bioethics and Humanities. With that, help me welcome Ron Bailey. Progress and its enemies. Um, I'm going to be taking a very unaccustomed role here today. Uh, basically, most people would describe me, and I have been described, as a cockeyed optimist, a techno-utopian, uh, a libertarian transhumanist, and so forth. And I just want to stress that whatever nostalgia is, I suffer from the exact opposite of whatever that is. The, I, I don't have future shock, I have future glee. This is what I'm looking forward to. And fortunately, Johan's excellent book, which you should all buy just as soon as you bought mine, uh, 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 completely uh, makes that case uh, and very strongly and powerfully does so. Um, so what I'm going to do is go through some of the challenges, at which uh, Johan also discussed, but go into a greater detail of what some of the enemies we might have to face as the 21st century unfolds. And 
Again, I was delighted to hear that Johan was quoting uh, Robert Heinlein, my, one of my favorite science fiction authors and a great intellect. But as you can see, he's making a very good point uh, that throughout history, poverty is the normal condition of humanity. In fact, Johan sh uh, showed that as a chart. Advances which permit this norm to be exceeded here and there, now and then, are the work of an extremely small minority, uh, frequently despised, often condemned, almost always opposed by all right-thinking people. Whenever this tiny minority is kept from creating, or as sometimes happened, is driven out of the society, the people then slip into abject poverty. This is known as bad luck. Venezuela is suffering from bad luck right at the moment, as an example. Um, but to highlight a bit more of what this is, 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 this, is how this progress might be stymied, I'd like to refer to a wonderful book by Northwestern University economist uh, Joel Mokir called The Gifts of Athena, Historical Origins of Knowledge. And he pointed out that history uh, shows that uh, technological progress in a society is by and large temporary and vulnerable process with many powerful enemies with a vested interest in the status quo or an aversion to change continuously threatening it. The net result is that changes in technology, the mainspring of economic progress, and most progress period, I would argue, have been relative to that, to what we now know human creativity is capable of. In other words, people in the Roman Empire and before were as smart as we were, but they were stymied. And we'll get into some of the reasons why they could not use their creativity to create the world that we live in. And that stasis or change at very slow rates has been the rule rather than the exception. Again, the wonderful data that Johan showed us. It is our own age, and, it, and especially the rap, the, uh, it, is, it is our own age, and especially the rapid technological change in the Western world that has been the historical aberration. So what happens? Well, Mokir basically points out that what occurs is that technological progress inevitably involves losers, and losers tend to be concentrated and find it easy to organize. Sooner or later, in any society, the progress of technology will grind to a halt because the forces that used to support innovation become vested interests. In a purely dialectical fashion, technological progress creates the very forces that eventually destroy it. I hope that's not true, but it is something we should be concerned about, is that, in fact, what you find is that vested interests over time, and we'll be discussing a bit more of that, get control of the government and stymie their, comp their competition. Another trend, though, that uh, Johan actually uh, describes brilliantly in his book is the trend in education around the world and how that is liberating both uh, boys and girls, men and women across the world. Unfortunately, there are some societies where this trend is being blocked and in some cases reversed, and that is a terrible, terrible problem. There are two problems with that. One is, is that uh, it has an effect on the choices that women make with regard to the number of children they would desire to have. And the second one is it also dramatically reduces the amount of, of growth and economic well-being that people can earn. Study after study shows that if women are educated to at least a secondary level of education, they complete their secondary education, their fertility uh, redu is reduced by a third to 50%. That is going down from, the, from basically five or six children in countries where women are not educated to two or three children. And part of the trend that we see, and I think is a very beneficial trend, and I talk about it in my book, is that world population is very likely to top out at around 9 billion people or so and begin falling during this century, largely, again, because women will have learned, have, I hope, will uh, be able to become educated and make choices that they want about their fertility. In addition, Educated women participate more in the in the wage uh, the wage economy, and this has huge benefits as well. Uh, McKinsey uh, economic consultancy just did a study where they where they calculated that if women were could achieve just the average level of education around the world, you see in in the world today, that the world economy would be would be an additional twelve billion dollars richer in 2025 than it is now. It would be an increase of over 11 percent. If men and women had the same level of education over that period of time, there would be 28 billion dollars more of GDP by 2025, an increase of 28 28 percent. In other words, we are foregoing by keeping women uneducated in those countries that do so a huge benefit for themselves and for us all. Um, 
Another problem that was discussed, uh, that Johan is discussing, is the problem of autark autarky. That is, the notion that every country should be self-sufficient, that a new, a new mercantilism that, unfortunately, our two presidential candidates, leading presidential candidates, I will not be voting for either of them, just for the record, uh, are in favor of restricting uh, free trade and exchange of ideas and immigration and so forth. And this is a terrible problem. Um, uh, if, if, if we can only produce what we have here in this country, we will be denying ourselves the benefits of what other people in other countries can produce more cheaply for us, and also the benefits of innovation and change. This is uh, an example of Smoot-Hawley, and what happened in the 1930s as the Great Depression was coming on was uh, Senator uh, uh, Smoot and uh, Representative Hawley managed to get uh, a, a, the trade managed to get the tariffs in the United States raised quite substantially, and the result was is that, uh, in over a two-year period between 1930 and 1932, U.S. trade uh, with Europe, uh, both exports and imports, fell by two thirds. Uh, of course, this led to huge job losses at that time. Within four years after that, uh, 24 other countries had also raised their tariff barriers, and world trade had fallen by almost two thirds at that point. Basically, it was a beggar thy neighbor activity, and this is the policy that some of our uh, leading politicians, will, whose names start with T and C, are recommending to us. This is, again, a, a terrible problem. And already, uh, we see that foreign direct investment in the United States is down by 40% from the peak uh, just before the, uh, the, the, the financial crisis and international trade is growing at its slowest rate ever. Have we achieved or fallen to uh, the nadir of, of globalization? Let us hope not. Then there's the problem of cronyism. Now this, you know, autarky is a problem with international trade largely, but this is an internal problem, basically. And just a, a quote from uh, uh, Lloyd Blank Fine, who, and, uh, as the uh, CEO of Goldman Sachs in 2015, said, more intense regulatory and technology requirements have raised barriers to entry higher than any other time in modern history. Sadly, he wasn't complaining about that. He was explaining that this was great for his company and for other companies like his because it made it possible to that competitors would not be able to challenge him and his company and that uh, extra profits could be earned from that. He was pointing that out as an advantage for himself. The problem is, is that uh, we see this uh, all the time with the accumulating burden of regulations and so forth. Uh, the Mercatus Institute, the Mercatus Center, I'm sorry, uh, just issued a study uh, back in June where they were calculating uh, what, the, what the regulatory drag on the United States would be, and I highly recommend looking at the study, but basically our economy is $4 trillion poorer than it would otherwise be basically because of our regulations. And most of those regulations do serve as barriers uh, to innovation and to competition. Uh, even more startling study was done in 2013 by John Dawson at Appalachian State University and John Cedar at North Carolina State, where they calculated the following, that if you could imagine keeping the regulatory burden at the level of 1949, what size would the US economy be now? It would be three times larger than it is now, they figure. I don't know. It seems that is a particular problem we need to be worried about. And again, uh, something we, that uh, Johan was highlighting. Um, this is, uh, well, this is President Putin and President uh, Xi Jinping of China. And I'm calling this The Return of the Natural State. One of the better books, well, actually one of the best books I read in the last 10 years is uh, by Nobel Prize winning economist uh, Douglas North and some colleagues of his called violence and social orders. And what they were trying to get at is the notion of how do we handle violence in society? And humanity, as, there were, as the agricultural revolution took off, uh, hit upon one solution, which is basically uh, what they call natural states. Natural states are essentially organized as patron-client networks. You have uh, top men, if you will, or elites who are militarily potent, and they arrange to have clients to whom they distribute economic resources. They basically hand out monopolies over time. And the point here is, is that this was the basic organization of human 
societies up until two centuries ago when open access orders began that rise that we, now, that we saw in the chart uh, from, uh, that Johan showed us earlier in, in economic growth. The problem is, is that, and Johan documents this very well uh, in, his, in his book, is that we have been moving in the direction of greater democracy, greater freedom, greater openness over time, using particularly the data from Freedom House, but that has stalled lately. Uh, the question here is, will it stall? Will we have a reversal of that over time? Uh, the thing about natural states is, is that as patron-client networks, and these, th if you think about this, and I would highly recommend you, that you do read this book, um, every state up until uh, the, the beginning of the 19th century, essentially, were, was organized this way. It was the Roman Empire, the Incan Empire, all the way up to uh, Putin's Russia, uh, or the Soviet Union. These were patron-client networks, and in every case, essentially, uh, those societies ultimately stopped innovation and stagnated. So the question is, can this be stopped over time? Can we continue the momentum forward uh, to, an op to more open access societies over time? Another problem is the growth of the surveillance society. Uh, this is a, a map, if you will, provided by Privacy International and published on the wonderful website Cato Unbound, uh, which basically su suggests to you that, for example, the United States is one of the worst societies with regard to surveillance. As we now know, Edward Snowden's, uh, through Edward Snowden's re revelations, that this is, in fact, a, a tremendous problem that we have in this country. Uh, the problem is, is that if you don't have privacy, if you don't have the space to, to talk amongst ourselves, then progress and innovation, both in the social level, can be stymied, and also will be stymied with innovation. That basically what you will find is that space where innovators uh, can talk among themselves uh, out of the limelight will, will be reduced over time and, and will slow down progress again. Uh, it would be very hard to operate in that kind of environment. And it's not just my opinion. Uh, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board uh, which reported to President Obama the following, permitting the government to routinely collect the calling records of the entire nation fundamentally shifts the balance of power between the state and its citizens. While the danger of abuse may seem remote, given historical abuse of personal information by government during the 20th century, the risk is more than merely theoretical. And it is more than merely theoretical. We still see people in Congress trying to expand expand the surveillance state in the United States. Um, <clears throat> earlier this year, Senator Di Dianne Feinstein and uh, Senator Richard Burr uh, introduced a bill they call the Compliance with Court Orders Act of 2016. Well, why shouldn't we apply, comply with court orders? Well, the problem is, is that it basically says that uh, web, web service providers, technologists, period, and telecommunications people must provide back doors to their technologies so that the government snoops can get in whenever they want to. The problem, of course, is, is that among many other things is we can't be sure what the government will do once they snoop with that information. And secondly, uh, bad guys can also find those same back doors and disrupt the economy and, and innovation as well. Uh, I do suspect that if they even thought about it a little bit, that the folks at the Democratic National Committee wish they had used end-to-end -end encryption. But in any case, now to what I think is possibly the worst public policy idea in all of history, and this includes communism, uh, is the precautionary principle, uh, which basically the proponents say, better safe than sorry. We shouldn't let any new technologies out until we've proven that they're completely safe, that this is one way to do it. I summarize it as never do anything for the first time. Uh, one perfect example of this, and, and there are lots of examples, unfortunately, uh, is the case of golden rice. Uh, golden rice is a biotech rice that has been developed 15 years ago, more than 15 years ago, that uh, is enhanced by adding, uh, if you will, the precursors to vitamin A. It helps vitamin A deficiency in countries that are rice cultures, that, that is their basic food. Um, and uh, Researchers have been trying to get this to poor people in, 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 uh, in Asia for a very long time, and it's been stymied by opposition by a lot of environmentalist groups, but none more than Greenpeace, which has been fighting this all the time. They 
have actually sent, sent thugs to the International uh, Rice Research Institute to dig up the crops and, and, and kill them off and that kind of thing. Um, the good news is that uh, in June, 100 Nobel Prize winners uh, wrote an open letter to Greenpeace excoriating them for this campaign, urging them to stop this, pointing out that by stymieing this technology, the World Health Organization estimates that between a quarter of a million and 500,000 kids go blind every year because of vitamin A deficiency in poor countries, and that half of these kids actually die within a year or two after that because vitamin A deficiency also means your immune system is not as strong as it might be to resist infections. And uh, the great news is, is that in this letter, the Nobelists asserted the Greenpeace campaign bordered on, and I think they're being too nice about bordering on a crime against humanity. This must be stopped. But this is just one example of how the precautionary principle is deployed across the globe. And there are lots of people who are in favor of this. One of my uh, favorites of this is a, a bioethicist at Yale University who wrote a book called A Dangerous Master, How to Keep Technology from Slipping Beyond Our Control. Uh, Wendell Wallach, uh, this, the author of this book, uh, is worried, quote, that our incessant outpouring of groundbreaking discoveries and tools are raising a tech storm that will soon be dangerously beyond our control. The question of the Harvest book is whether, quote, we, humanity as a whole, humanity as a whole, have the intelligence to, to navigate the promise and perils of technological innovation. Now, how does he want to navigate this in a precautionary manner? How does he want to do this? Well, his solution is to create, this is his title, governance coordinating committees uh, that will guide policymakers and the public. The uh, committees would be for comprehensively coordinate the development of different scientific fields and oversee the industries that, that each field creates. So this would be biotechnology, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, robotics, what have you. In other words, they would function, these governance coordinating committees would function as gatekeepers, giving permission, or most likely not, to the rest of us to develop and use technologies. Without apparent ir irony, Wallach writes, and I quote, moderating the adoption of technology, moderating the adoption of technology should not be done for ideological reasons, as though the idea of moderating progress is not itself not ideological. In any case, um, those are just some cautions that I do have uh, and worries about it. I actually think that the future, uh, that, that the 10 reasons that are offered in Johann's book uh, are more likely to come true than not. And I would like to, once again, restore your faith and the faith of the rest of the public in, in progress. And Johann's book would go a great deal in that direction. And I heartily, heartily recommend it. You can't buy too many copies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ron. Um, we now have some time for Q&A. Um, I would like to ask you to please raise your hand if you have a question, then, when, uh, then wait for the mic to get to you. And if you could please tell us uh, who you are, uh, make the question short in a form of a question and address it to a, uh, uh, to, to a speaker. Um, yes, right there. Hello. Uh, hi, I'm Jung Huang, a uh, Cato intern. Uh, quick question, because I really like your book, uh, Financial Fiasco and Protection of uh, Capitalism. Uh, and one of the things I'm seeing, and this is a question I'm asking every peop every person I see that is for free market and free trade, is that since the market is something invisible that people can see, it's difficult for a normal person to, to trust it. It's an issue of trust. However. It's easy to trust the government because it's visible and they can hear uh, what, the policy, what their policies and what their incentives are. So what, uh, what is a method that we could have to make people trust something that is, it, that is invisible? Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's a very good question. Um, and of course, that's the eternal problem. In an election campaign, it seems like... Uh, 
fewer people are interested in the um, slogan, I don't know how America is going to be great again, but if I give all of you more freedom to experiment with various ideas, I'm sure some of you will come up with something, some amazing technologies and business models that will be wonderful, and I have no idea which ones they are. They seem more interested in the kinds of slogans that I'll make this happen, I'll do this. Trust me, I'm, I'm, I'm the big tough guy here. I'll make people do that. So it's a problem of, in a way, how we communicate this um, trust in, in markets and in individuals rather than specific political um, forces. On the other hand, I don't see that problem of trust in people's everyday activities. On the contrary, people do not have a problem in going into a store and buying things from people they've never seen and eating it, <laughs> even though it might be poison. People just, yeah, I can go here when I have to travel to another city and just get a car from a rental firm just by showing my piece of plastic from Sweden. And it's all fine, it's all perfect, and it works out in 99.9% of all the cases, and people trust the market in that uh, regard and trust the rule of law. It's only when they make the shift into the kind of political system, the kind of economic system that they like, that they, for some reason, forget their personal experiences and the fact that they dislike and do not trust the politicians that they are voting for again and again and end up in this kind of uh, constant uh, search for an authority uh, figure. So that's an internal communications problem and I think one of the most important thing is to making people understand their own personal trust in the market and that that's something that they should generalize into when they're, when they're voting as well. I actually don't have a solution to that problem. I wish I did. Why don't you work on that and figure it out? <laughs> uh, what, one of, one of the, 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 the major concerns is, that, I mean, this is a problem that Bastiat came up with, with the, you know, the visible and the, the, the seen and the unseen example, whereas the policies are the thing that we see, whereas all the other stuff that is, that is working for us is exactly what you say. It is invisible. It is unseen. And you know, I, I would have everybody read Bastiat every day as their you know, wake-up prayer. Um, let's start here in front. Yes, I'll try to get as many. Herb Rose, uh, my question is directed to Mr. Please Norberg. speak up a little. Uh, my question is directed to Mr. Norberg. Um, I subscribe to the. Uh, glass half full, ha glass half empty. Uh, you made some very cogent arguments uh, how things have improved worldwide, uh, but I would turn the question back on you. In this country, we still have uh, poverty and we still have hunger, uh, and I ask you whether Scandinavia has the same degree of poverty and hunger, and why shouldn't our glass be fuller? Well, I'm, I'm pro full glasses, as full as they, they can get. Um, and uh, the question is really about, well, my own country, Sweden, and, and um, our neighboring countries. And, uh, well, we have a generally a higher degree of equality, material equality, than the United States, um, even though on a lower material level than most other places. And um, I think all other things... Uh, uh, Ceteris parbus, if it's the same thing. We prefer uh, people not to be in poverty and not to end up in difficult circumstances. But there is a difficult trade-off as well, and that one is um, we've done that by um, increasing wages, um, de facto minimum wages, with because the trade unions are very much in control of the labor market, and fairly generous um, welfare systems. And that means that I would, it would be difficult to find an example of people in desperate poverty in Sweden, people who cannot make ends meet so that they cannot eat. On the other hand, it also means that many, many of them are shut off from the labor market entirely. It means that they are socially excluded from the rest of society because they don't go up to a job in the morning. And that's something that we realize right now because we have a very large recent refugee population in Sweden. And we've created a society that's very good if you have the right level of education, if you 
are very productive, you know the language and everything, then it's easy to get a job and get a wage that's higher than the welfare requirements and, and things like that. But if you don't, you're sh priced out of the market. If you have a productivity level that's around 80% of average, well, then you're priced out of the market. So we see a rise in unemployment, a rise in social exclusion. It does not mean desperate poverty. It does not mean hunger. But it means a terrible blow to self-esteem, to status in society, in relation to your neighbors and even your children. And that results in a kind of, not a material desperation, but a social desperation that's really quite problematic in, in Sweden right now. Uh, so so um, I'll just leave those facts on the table and then we can all sort of decide back and forth on the costs and benefits of, of the various systems. Uh, just one thing, I, I was I'm very puzzled because, uh, as we know, lots of uh, people on the left cite Denmark and Scandinavia as a, as a good example of social mobility and equality and so forth. Two other facts on the table when I started looking into it. Uh, one is, is that if you look at the Gini coefficients, that is the amount, the, the degree of inequality from the lowest to the highest, if you look at the, for, for example, in Germany and France, that before taxes, they're actually much higher than the United States before taxes. Uh, they're quite, quite comparable in Denmark and Scandinavia, just a little bit lower than those cases. So the equality is achieved by taxing the rich, essentially. The other side about it is that everybody's going, well, social mobility is greater. Well, if you look at the quintiles of population, and I, I happen to look at these for Denmark, the fact of the matter is, is that from getting to the lowest quintile to the highest quintile in Denmark, you move from $20,000 a year to about $65,000 a year. In the United States, that's a journey of $20,000 a year to $160,000 a year. It's a lot harder to get to $160,000 a year, but more Americans do that. But, so the top is a, lot, is a lot, if you want social mobility to go between quintiles, go to Denmark, but you're not going to get a lot of money out of that. Can I just add something to complicate the picture even further about Sweden and the other Scandinavian countries. Um, I sometimes meet Bernie Sanders supporters who say that the United States should be more like Sweden or, well, let's pick Sweden because it's where I come from. Um, and then I tell them, well, in that case, you have to have more free trade than the United States. You have to have a more deregulated market generally and more open product markets. You need to introduce school vouchers so that people are entitled to go to any kind of private school and, and keep the, the money uh, and, and do that. You have to partially privatize the so social security system. You have to uh, abolish property taxes and you have to abolish death taxes and a couple of other things. When it comes to almost any area except this thing with taxations and specific labor market regulations, Sweden and Denmark are more economically free than the United States. So it is a very open economy. Then it tries to redistribute more of the results of, of that. And again, and I, I just leave that at the table for, for everybody, including Sanders supporters. A brief anecdote about that. Um, he ran this pro-Scandinavian campaign and at the same time was the, the worst protectionist since well, since Donald Trump, uh, I tell Bernie Sanders supporter an anecdote about when President Obama visited Sweden, because then he was approached by the three big labor unions in Sweden, and they are socialists, especially the big blue collar one. It's very much affiliated with the Social Democrats, and they basically fund them. Um, their message to President Obama was, we want to talk to you about an important subject, and that's free trade, and why we need more free trade, between, especially between Europe and the United States, because that's the only way in which we can constantly upgrade and restructure our economy and give people better jobs and higher wages in the future. We think you're too much of a protectionist, President Obama, from the Swedish socialists. Um, lastly, I uh, want to also commend to your research by uh, Jonathan Y from uh, um, Duke University. Uh, in a recent paper, he found that uh, hereditability of wealth is actually higher in Europe than in the United States. Mm -hmm. Roughly 12% of wealthy individuals in the United States have inherited their wealth. In Denmark, that figure is 25%, so roughly double of the rate of the United States. So I recommend that research to you. Let's take a question on this side. 
gentleman in the glasses over there. Um, uh, Pat Span, I um, was listening to uh, Mr. Norberg's presentation and uh, to follow on from his uh, ending quote from the uh, uh, from Star Trek. Um, do you see the, the current system of the nation state as uh, some sort of impediment to the future progress? Or and uh, I mean, are you, you sound you sound like you're sort of a one world globalist. Does, do you do you see the nation the concept of the nation state, i.e., the United States, as a detriment detrimental thing? Hmm. Uh, yeah, in relation to the United Federation of Planets, right. It's <laughs> we're, we're not there yet. Um, I don't think that we should have a world government. I think that's a bad idea. I don't really care where the lines are drawn, but I think it's incredibly important with some institutional competition so that we have many v different political uh, areas that have different rules and institutions so that we can see what works and what doesn't. And hopefully people will imitate the ones that create more progress and more human freedom. Uh, so I'm not in favor of abolishing nation states in that sense. But I am opposed to the kind of tariffs, the kind of walls that are being built between countries so that uh, people, citizens, are banned or heavily regulated when they want to engage in peaceful capitalist acts between consenting adults. Uh, basically, um, trade, exchange, movement, those, all those things, which is something that you can do even though you have nation states if they're open to, to individual freedom and economic freedom. Yes, here in front. Uh, Edward Hudgens, um, Peter Diamandis, who uh, you know founded the X Prize and uh, as well as uh, Singularity University, has a book very much in the spirit of your excellent book called Abundance. Uh, this points to my question concerns the audience for this kind of information. We have an audience of achievers, of tech folks, of transhumanists, of uh, biohackers, uh, of all of these sorts of folks who love their work, who are leading the progress, who want at least enough political freedom and economic freedom to do what they love doing, yet they tend to be kind of soft leftists because if they look at the GOP, they see Donald Trump and so on and so forth. Would this be a community that, to answer the question of how do we get around uh, you know, the pessimism and all, that you could mobilize? Uh, because one of the things young people are excited about is technology, even though you have the, uh, the, the pessimists that uh, Ron uh, pointed out uh, quite well. I think that's a very good point. And one thing that you do see when it comes to optimists versus pessimists is that people who do things, they are normally optimists, um, whereas those who do not. If they do not engage with uh, innovation, with technology, with new markets and so on, they only tend to see the problems. And as Ron pointed out, the, the, the problems are often concentrated, whereas the, um, the benefits often go to the whole of society. But if you feel like you're a driver behind these uh, events and those things, then you're more of a natural optimist and you should be more in favor of more freedom to do things like that. And I definitely think that that's a group that should be mobilized more and I don't know why that hasn't happened yet. Ron probably knows more of these people than I do, so perhaps he's got a better response. Actually, I'm not sure I do have a better response. It's been, it's been a puzzle to me as well. Uh, for example, I cover and have been covering biotechnology for over 30 years. Uh, and a lot of biotechnologists uh, are weirdly inherently precautionary. And uh, part of it stems from the fact that they did not want to commit the same, quote, crime that the physicists did with the development of the atomic bomb. So they set up a system of... of a precaution at the Silinar Conference in the 1970s, and it's followed from there. And it's, and and the truth is that when you talk to people who are the real innovators, as opposed to academic academic uh, uh, biotechnologists, they're quite frustrated by the system. But it, it it is it is set up that way. Now I see it unraveling. Now one of the great things is is that the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, recently had a meeting uh, to discuss the amazing new CRISPR gene editing technology 
And CRISPR, by the way, if you haven't heard of it, is going to completely change the world in 10 years in ways that you are not going to recognize. It's going to be amazing. That is, if we can get the precautionary people out of it. But the great news is, is that the National Academy of Sciences was asked to essentially ban using that technology for use in human beings. And they said, well, actually, no. We need to go slow, but we're not going to be in favor of a ban. So I, I see some cracks in that, in that regard as well. But uh, it is a race between the technologists and the precautionary activ activism. And I don't know who's going to win that. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping f that there'll be 10 more good reasons to look forward to the future. <laughs> That's a great sequel book, <laughs> I think. Thomas Lambert, I'm from Belgium. And I have a question for Mr. Norberg. Could you speak with, up louder? Or with yeah. regard to the refugee situation, some would call it the refugee crisis in Europe. Um, Angela Merkel from Germany has said, wir schaffen das, uh, we, can, we can make it. But let's suppose that she would consult you and say, well, I foolishly launched that sentence, but I forgot to develop the arguments. And now I have to address a crowd of um, worried people, very critical people angry people, and she needs you to develop the arguments, a one-pager, a, a set of arguments to calm them down, to put things in perspective. How would you respond to that? Thank you. <laughs> it would have to be a very well-paid position uh, for me to accept that, I think, because um, that would take some really hard work off from other things. I think that the refugee crisis, and I think we should call it that because a lot of countries were really overwhelmed uh, last year in Europe by this influx from Syria, but also Afghanistan and several other countries, um, to an incredibly big extent. And at the same time, we have almost a planned economy in Europe when it comes to any kind of reception uh, in, in accepting new refugees. Um, they're not allowed to work. They're not allowed to start working. It's a long asylum process. In Sweden, it could take two years until you know whether you can stay or not. Until then, you're in a, um, a government-directed uh, place where you, where you sit there all day. And everything is heavily regulated, but are paid people who take care of everything from cleaning to uh, preparing food, which is a strange thing, which gives people the impression that apparently if you're a refugee, you should stop preparing your own food as well. You can't even clean your own uh, house. So basically they're pacified in, in so many ways and they do not get the kind of connection with societies that they need in order to, to be integrated. Uh, what do I tell Angela Merkel? Well, I, first of all, I, I'd have to say that, look, the only thing that could make this work is that people are, they get a basic solidarity with the new societies that they've come to uh, and they only get that if they are integrated by the labor market, if they start working, if they learn the language on the job, if they get new friends and neighbors whom they interact with constantly and go to school so that their, their kids start learning the language and get a, a taste for the kind of culture that they, that they enter. Uh, if that happens, I think there's a chance that they could be not just well integrated, but also very useful, productive members of society. Um, We've got a demographic situation in Europe that's disastrous. Uh, we have no way of knowing how uh, I will get any kind of retirement or social security in the future because there are too few workers. We have huge problems in the healthcare sector, many of low-skilled jobs that where we don't have enough people. They should be able to fill this in. But the problem is we've got very high minimum wages. We've got very high taxes. It's incredibly expensive to hire anyone to do anything. Uh, and because it's all done for very homogeneous, uh, homogeneous societies where people have the same education, they have the same language, they have a lot of experience and so on, then you can enter the labor market. Um, but that means that it's very easy to get your second job but you never get your first job. And this is something that's difficult for uh, domestically born um, uh, uh, young people as well. We have very high youth unemployment as well. It's not just immigrants and refugees. Um, so I would start telling Merkel that we have to deal with that. We have to radically uh, liberalize the labor market. We have to radically change the system of taxation so that hope, 
I don't understand why we tax uh, individual income come at all. Uh, we should find we should reduce taxes, but we should find other tax bases as well if uh, if we are to to deal with this uh, thing. So basically, she opened the external border for a while, but she forgot that there's another border around the labor market and around society. So people end up in between, and that's a disaster, that's a nightmare, that's the thing that creates social exclusion, and that's also what creates um, separation from society and also uh, some hatred against this society that puts you in this situation and attracts some people, a few people, not even close to a majority, to radical Islamist ideas, and that's incredibly dangerous. So if we open that external border, we have to open the internal border as well. So I think, unfortunately, uh, we have run out of time. Um, I know there are many more questions, but uh, both of our speakers are going to stick around to sign uh, books and to answer questions. And also, please don't forget that uh, lunch uh, is served uh, upstairs. Uh, thank you very much for your attendance and uh, help me thank our speakers today.